Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm the host, Sean Boyce. I'd like to welcome my guest and friend to the show today, Mike Max, who is a leader of Aprio's CPA Firm Alliance, also referred to as Firm Foundation. Hello, Mike. How are you? And thanks for being on the show. You're welcome, Sean. I'm excited to be here and to share a little bit about my journey and, and what we're doing now. It's nice to see Super you again, stoked. too, after Vegas. Likewise, my friend. We got to connect and engage in Vegas, which was an awesome time. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to just connect with you, network with all of your people, learn so much uh, at the conference and and then being able to connect with all of your peers as well also. So that was an awesome time. Uh, and I'm super excited to help tell uh, your story about what you're working on, which is uh, really powerful stuff. And I want to encapsulate it as best I can, but no one's going to quite tell that story uh, as well as you will. So I'm going to lean on you pretty heavily there. But before we dive into that, what would be great for most of our listeners to develop a better relationship with you as well also is if you wouldn't mind telling uh, whatever version of your story that you'd like to, which because it's a really awesome story. And I know you presented that at the Engage conference that was super well attended, standing room only. Uh, it was a very moving presentation. So as much of that as you can recapture in this short window, feel free to uh, do it however you'd like. That would be awesome. Great. Thanks a lot, John. I, I really like telling the story because it, it's got like four parts that all go at the same time. And the most powerful part, I think, for me is how much the other people in my world and life mattered as part of the journey. It definitely wasn't taken alone. I definitely leaned on my friends and colleagues, mentors and peers throughout the entire journey. So it started out out of college. I had a job interview and offer from Arthur Anderson back when it existed. And I was super excited. Went to college, got a job at a big five firm. Super stoked, right? And then Enron and WorldCom happened. And I ended up graduating with no job. So I found a job at a small three-partner firm near my house in Connecticut and did the normal staff accountant thing there, right? I learned a bunch of stuff in accounting. I did taxes. I did audit. I did some valuation work, just a lot of different technical things I got to touch and see the whole process. And that's the benefit that a small firm offers. They were really great about teaching me a lot of things. Where it didn't quite flow right for me was... It was that old model, use and abuse, how much control can they have over each person? Uh, it, like some of the little things that were examples that you probably wouldn't hear about now, where we had to check in and check out for lunch, had to be within a certain time frame. There was a day where I left early to go, I don't know, play golf maybe, but I had come in early and I got my eight hours in and I still had to go use PTO. Like just little things like that, that kind of end up irking the hell out of you. Yep. So I decided that wasn't quite the right place for me. So I moved on to another three partner firm that one of my friends worked at. Funny story was that between the time I was leaving and starting, she left. So I didn't end up working with my friend. Uh, I ended up being the kind of one person tax department there because that firm was really audit heavy. So I did a little bit more auditing in the summer, got really good at, at taxes, uh, revamped our entire process there. Because, you know, with three partners, there were three ways of doing it, right? <laughs> so I was like, wait, hold on, guys. If I'm going to scale this at all, we got to have a process and I can teach people what the process is. So I took the best practices of each partner, put it together into our process, tweaked it a couple of times after some feedback and, and ran with that, taught some other folks what that was. While I was at this firm, I read a Journal of Accountancy article about the AICPA's first leadership academy. And as soon as I read the article, I put it on the corner of my desk. I wrote the date that I could apply the next year. And I said, this is what I have to do. Like, this is the next step in my journey. Go from technician to leader. I went through Leadership Academy and it was just so mind-bogglingly awesome. I still have friends to this day that I met there. Uh, it was water through a fire hose for the leadership sense. But what it really taught you was this is step one in a journey. And dealing with people and leading constantly changes and evolves how you approach it changes and you just really learn how to be adaptable in that leadership journey leadership academy has since grown they have 13 or 14 classes now it's over 450 people strong maybe even 500 so that network has really grown and i made sure as the network grew i stayed in touch with the folks that also went through leadership academy and then the people that uh, we met through it, like Tanya, our mutual friend, and then we get introduced to you. It's a very inclusive environment. So when we find those future-oriented, like-minded thinker, thinkers, we bring them into the fold. It's not exclusive. You don't have to have gone through it. 
it's just a matter of it gives you that network of people who think different, understand where the profession can go and want to help get it there. During my journey, I leaned heavily on this group. Uh, we have a Slack channel and once a week, maybe I was just writing down what was going through my head. Like, this is why I don't want to be a tax partner anymore. I can't believe I worked my entire career for this job and I hate it. Like, I don't want to do it anymore. Or this is, or something else about where the profession was going and why can't we get there? What are the roadblocks? Here's how I would go tackle those. And the feedback I got from the group was was really powerful for me to understand that I was at the right part of my journey to, to take a leap. So after I went through Leadership Academy, figured out that that firm kind of wasn't the right place for me either. Uh, the straw there was I had a, a performance review that they really only remember the last six weeks of stuff that you do in those, right? So I basically got yelled at for half an hour for something I messed up three weeks before. I was like, but what about the year's worth of good stuff I did? Like, I don't just come here to get yelled at in a performance review. Like, come on, guys, that's not right. So decided that that wasn't the right place for me. Didn't quite know what I was going to do next. I kicked around the idea of uh, going to work with my dad, who's also a CPA. That didn't quite feel right either. Not quite what I wanted to do. And then I was fortunate to find Filomino and Company in West Hartford that was like on step six of that leadership track. They had outside consultants that were actively teaching us leadership and management skills. We got constant reinforcement. Uh, I got a lot better at, at learning what being a leader really was, which was the next step I needed after that initial entree through the Leadership Academy. The powerful moment there was they sat me down in a conference room one day, the entire partner group, the two consultants, and they were like, you walk around the firm wearing a mask all the time. Like you give us the answer that you think we want to hear. We want to hear what you really think. Like, why don't you think that what, like how you normally show up is good enough? And it was, it was a hard day, right? To hear some of that. Um, but it was an important part for me to realize that I had to be willing to be vulnerable in my leadership journey and show up as my authentic self because people are really good at spotting phonies. And that's what some of my colleagues thought I was. They didn't know who I really was. So I worked pretty hard the next few years to try to get out of my own way, break down that wall that I had put up, and and really just take that big giant step into to who I am. Which is easy as that sounds, it's a super scary journey to take to just show up authentically all the time. But it was an important one, and I had the support from the firm. And through that. I then ended up kind of skyrocketing through the ranks in a few years and made my way to partner. So I'm super stoked about making partner. Uh, my mom happened to be visiting from Florida that day. So I got to, to call her and tell her in person when I got home from work. Uh, my wife was crying. My mom was crying. Like we were hugging. It was great. And then that night I saw my dad and stepmom at my wife's chorus concert. So I got to tell them in person. It was, it was a really, really good day in, in my professional life. So I go to the, the first meeting in January of what it's like to be a partner. And they go, by the way, we're merging. Okay. <laughs> so I don't really get to be a partner here. Uh, so I went through, you know, busy season and we merged in the summer. And I thought, oh, I've never been part of a really big firm before. Let me give this everything that I've got. There's so many opportunities, so many resources, so many new people that that I can meet and work with. And as part of the leadership journey, our job is also to create other leaders. It's not to create followers. So I thought this is another really big group of people that I can go find who our future leaders are and pull them up through the ranks with me. So I really enjoyed that part. After a couple of years there, the pandemic hit and they were looking for volunteers to lead the CARES Act teams. And it's tax season, right? I'm a tax partner. I've got a bunch of work to do. So I was like, I'd love to do that, but I don't know where I'm going to find the time. Then they extended the tax deadline. So I was like, oh, all right, me, me, I'll do that. But this is a, a cool way to showcase my leadership skill set to the larger firm as a whole, being one of the regional leaders, talking with the other regional leaders around the country. So I jumped full bore into that. At the same time, every other accountant's going through the same CARES Act stuff, right? 
So I hop on tax Twitter and I'm reading through what they're posting, what they think the rules are saying. Our leadership Academy group started a weekly zoom call where we'd go through the law changes and say, all right, what do we think this means? What do we think this means? What questions do we still have that are unanswered? Is this part ambiguous or unclear? Is this part clear? What are potential solutions while we're waiting for these answers? So I definitely leaned heavily on the outside network to help me with my internal role too. And through that, I ended up being one of our thought leaders at the company around the CARES Act, the Payroll Protection Program, the ERC. And me and another woman out of our Ohio office kind of became the go-to people for writing articles and doing webinars. And over the course of the six months, we did 46 of them. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So then I'm like, all right, I had a really good year. I'm looking forward to my partner review. I've got ideas about what I want to talk about. I really prepared. My firm was very metrics driven, charge hours, realization, utilization, new business that you brought in. What did you produce? So I was like, all right, I knew all my metrics and I also knew what I wanted to do next. So I was like, all right, I can leverage this leadership opportunity into the next one. So I'd show up. First thing they say is, hey, so you did a great job with all the CARES Act stuff, but you missed your charge hour goal by 300 hours. What? Okay. Um, pause and breathe for a moment. I had a $1.2 million budget and a 1,200 charge hour goal, and I did $1.8 million in 900 chargeable hours. So I beat my production goal by 50%. And at the end of the day, the production is what the clients get and why and how they pay us. So I hit the most important metric and killed it. They said, yeah, but if you worked more, we'd make more. And I said, well, why would I reward myself with more work if I got all of it done so efficiently? I said, I just wanted to go home and take a nap. Like It was a hard year. Uh, and they just kind of wouldn't get over that the basic metric of charge hours. And I thought all right, let me see if I could redirect this conversation. You know, all is not lost because of one comment. And if I keep hitting the production goal, I still really don't care about charge hours. So I said, all right, well, I just did a really good job on the CARES Act stuff. I showcased a leadership skill set to the entire firm. My name's known around the country and inside of our firm. So that means if I do something next, there's already that kind of name cachet associated with it. So some people will pay attention. They'll open the emails. I said, so what's one of those things? Like, what's next on your list of things that you wish you had somebody that could run it? I know that we've got a one-year runway still on the, the CARES Act stuff, so I could wrap that up, transition it. I'll probably have to transition some client work so that I could take on this new responsibility. What do you think? And they go, well, you need to get like $3 million of production and a million of origination and 1,200 chargeable hours to fill up your scorecard. And then we look at you for leadership. Those are two different skill sets. <laughs> One doesn't mean you're good at the other. In fact, it, I'd be hard pressed to find someone who's really good at production and origination who's also really good at leadership. So, so I was like looking at the, the group, the three people, and they're way too close in age to me. I thought, I can't wait you guys out and you're not going to change your mind. It's like, all right, I'm out. Like in my head, I was just all done. And this was the middle of January. I walked downstairs from the bedroom. Jen sees me and she goes, what's wrong? I'm like, that didn't go well. I want to quit right now. If I put my notice in 90 days is April 16th. Like I could just be done. Jen in her ultimate wisdom, she goes, well, you worked really hard last year. When do you get your bonus? Ah, I get my bonus at the end of March. She goes, what's 90 days after then? I thought, no, oh, that's the end of June. That sounds way better. <laughs> well said, go Jen. <laughs> yeah. And then she is, she says, um, you should also call Amber, the business coach that you've talked to a couple of times. She's she's gonna be really helpful. And to be honest, I don't think that I can be the best person for you to be constantly venting to. Like you're gonna need this this other ear to bend on that. This way that we can keep our relationship where it is and and it's not just going to get overwhelmed. So she had another really great piece of wisdom. So I called Amber Setter. She's my business coach. She was phenomenal helping me walk through the different stages of grief, ultimately, right, that that you go through when you, you're trying to make a big decision. 
she had me read a book called the great leap by gay hendrix super good uh it made me realize that tax partnering was in my zone of excellence i'm really good at it i enjoy doing it but it's not the highest and best use of my time and what i should be doing the zone of genius is that space and I feel like that's where I'm living right now in my current role of trying to help accounting firms with the issues that that they have and the resources that they need. And I love connecting people with resources so that they can get stuff done. So I go through that process. I put in my notice and the firm goes, oh, so it stinks that you're leaving. So where are you going? And I said, Hawaii. And they're like, no, no, like, where are you going to work? I was like, nowhere. I don't have a job right now. I'm just leaving. And that's a pretty powerful statement for people to hear when you just walk out without a parachute, without a net. It's just, oh, yeah. see you later. So we went to Hawaii for two weeks, loved the downtime, the relaxing, the ocean, the two straight weeks with the family. It was rejuvenating. On the way home, we stopped in Las Vegas for the Engage conference. And I show up with my name badge and it just says change agent. It caught people's attention. They were like, where do you get that job? I was like, funny story. I'm unemployed. Like, it's not a job. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you get these quizzical looks all the time. Like, well, what do you mean you don't have a job? Like, what are you doing here? I was like, I'm networking. I'm trying to figure out who has a role that fits what I want to do. We've had the same five problems in accounting for the last 20 years, and we're not doing squat about it. I want to change that. I want to go work on value versus time, on family issues, DEI initiatives, uh, putting people at the same level as the importance of the work, making sure we're doing good, good quality client service. And firms don't have the time or resources to do that. And that's what I want to do to help them. I don't know who's going to pay me for it. I don't know what the job is called. And someone goes, is that accounting firm in Connecticut? I was like, no, it's not. If it was, I would have called them. So are you going to move? No, because if that accounting firm exists and wants to hire me for this, they're definitely okay with remote work. And we've been doing it for two years. Like it's not a big deal. Someone else said, well, isn't that just an admin job? Like, you're only going to make like a hundred grand a year doing that. And you could make half a million dollars being a tax partner. Like, I don't even understand. I thought you were smart. I said, well, it's what I want to do. And I know there's not a thousand of these jobs out there, but I only need one. I just need one company that's crazy enough to think the way that I do, that believes in what I believe in, that's going to pay me to go do something in this arena. Do you know them? Because I'd love an introduction. They're like, no, I don't know anybody like that. And I'm thinking, well, considering your line of questioning, I really didn't expect you to, but okay. <laughs> awesome. So now we get back to the power of the network, right? I had never heard of Aprio, didn't know they existed, but my friend had. And John Bly, who's who's my partner, he reached out to his network and said, we're looking for this role to lead a, an alliance that we're acquiring. Who do you know? And two of my friends that are in my network both said, oh, you need Mike to run that. John's like, who the heck is Mike? So he looks me up on LinkedIn. We connect and chat. Short story. Now I'm sitting here at Aprio running Firm Foundation, which is our alliance of small and mid-sized CPA firms. I love every day of what I'm doing. I get to connect the firms with the resources they need. And what I've really found is the five or six problems that have been the issues in accounting for a long time they're still symptoms. They're not really the core problem. The core problem is nobody has the time to dedicate to go fix those symptoms. So a big part of my role is giving those firms their time back by taking on the time burden. I do that by telling them, hey, send me an email in three minutes with the issue that you're having and I'll go find the resource. I'll spend my 45 minutes doing that. You go spend 45 minutes on your client service or your firm strategy. You need your best client needs a weird one ask pro, one off project. Don't spend your time learning how to do it. You're never going to do it again. We can do that work for you. We work really well with other accounting firms. We put your firm first, your client second, and us third in our priority list. And we'll do that project. 
you spend those 40 hours on firm strategy, on talent retention, on talking to your people on how to keep them. So each time that I'm doing something, I'm reminding the firms, I'm giving you time back to spend it differently, to spend intentionally. Like here are ideas on how that you could spend it based on what I've heard you talk about in our meetings. And those are really fun conversations to have. I get to challenge the historical norms that are in the profession. And I basically get to sit up on my soapbox all the time and, and shout from the rooftops all the stuff that I believe in. And, and the firms are listening and they're, they're starting to make the move from what got them here isn't going to get them there. But we're helping to provide the resource to help get them there. Such a cool story, Mike. I, I, I could listen to that story over and over again. <laughs> it was awesome the first time I heard it. I feel like it's even better the second time around. So thank you for sharing that story. It's a really aspirational journey and an awesome one at that. And then as you're talking about kind of following that passion to what led you to Firm Foundation now, that mission is amazing, especially at the moment for accounting firms everywhere, right? So. I want to ask you more about, because we talk a lot about that on this show, right? As you know, a lot of the work that I do is also in figuring out how to get firms time back so they can reinvest it in better areas for growth or whatever aligns best with their goals and objectives. With the, like the foundation of Firm Foundation, really, and the work that you're doing, what are some of the more common, I guess, strategies or even you mentioned symptoms where there is the biggest opportunity to get some of these firms that time back so they could make the progress that they want. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. I think one area that nearly every firm can put some time and energy into is look at your client base as if you're transitioning it to the next leader. Like you're going to retire tomorrow and you need a place to put those clients. That makes you think about your client list a little bit differently. Because as you see a name on a line in a spreadsheet, immediately the history of that client comes to your head, whether it's a good history or a pain in the ass history, like it comes to your right to the forefront of your brain. And if we want Sean to be the next leader in this accounting firm and to run this client base, like what do I need to tell Sean about my client base? And if you get that feeling in the pit of your stomach when you see that name and it's uncomfortable because the client just isn't a good one, it's a good one to put on the list of maybe we shouldn't be doing this work, or maybe we need to have a conversation with them about how the work is done, the areas that are causing us frustration. But they're hard conversations. They're they're not comfortable. And accountants in general, by and large, don't really enjoy conflict. Numbers don't argue with you. They don't get upset. So it's really hard to do. But as you're looking through that client list, like you want to transition it, I also have to think, how can I make this sound appealing to Sean? I want you to take over this client list. And if you look at it and you go, wow, that's a lot of work and not all of it's great work. What's a way that we can kind of get around that? What if instead of looking at the client list and trying to find the time to do all the work, you looked at the time that you want to spend on the work and you filled that up first with your A plus and your B clients and see when you run out of time, you know, draw that line in the sand of, I don't want to work more than X hours, fill up your capacity based on the hours reports that we have with the best work that you want to do, and then see what falls below the line and then look at it. Can I get some of those up above the line? Can I, Can I move my line down by implementing some automations, by taking the client accounting services work for this good client that takes 20 hours a month, automating it down to five hours a month? I just cleared up 15 hours. I can pull three more of those other projects back into my capacity. I love the the thought process here and that it is a construct, right? Just turning it on its head. Instead of starting with like, here's all the stuff I have to do, and then just meeting that regardless of how practical that may be. Uh, instead, start with the time and set those bounds first. Then now you're forced to prioritize, right? So you're going to pick the ones that make the most sense, where you have the best leverage or where you're going to be able to offer the most value. That sounds like a great prioritization exercise to go through. Yeah. And because it's all data-driven and accountants like playing with numbers, it's not difficult to execute. It's time-intensive. but it's summertime, right? If you want to 
reprioritize your client list before the next busy season, now's a really good time to get started on it. You don't That's have to say. do it all at once. You know, you could have a partner retreat and spend a couple of days with your partner group going through it. Uh, if you need someone to be the bad guy in the room, you can have a facilitator show up and be like, Sean, you know, that's not a good client. You really shouldn't, you know, be making excuses or rationalizing why you're putting them up above that line because Katie and Sarah and John hate when that client calls them. Like they yell at them, they pay their bill bad, they don't, they short pay, they pay late. They're just, they drop their stuff off on April 11th, like whatever it is, like, you know, that doesn't belong there, right? If you're partners with people, sometimes that's a hard conversation too. So that facilitator can can be the bad guy that that can rally the group together by being the the common enemy. Well said, agreed. That sounds like a great exercise to go through in that kind of a format as well. Also, um, so Mike, for firms that are maybe listening into this uh, content that are excited about the possibilities here, what's a way they should be thinking about going forward with something like this or you know, uh, learning from you, connecting with you. I'd love to hear more about what type, like what's the best advice you have for them in terms of whether or not they're ready to do something like this or how they should start thinking about it if this is really starting to catch their attention. So as they're looking at these client lists, they should be paying attention to, you know, what industries or niches are you already in that you didn't quite realize that you're in? And if you've only got one construction client, even if it's really big and you love them and they're great clients, should you really be doing that one construction client? And if your answer is yes, okay, how do you build off of it? You know, do they have subcontractors you can try to pick up? Who else do they do job bids for? Uh, you can get a lot of information in the public in a construction industry by seeing who's bidding on, on government projects. So like that's a specific example of places you can get information. And as you find these niches, that's going to be areas where you can you can grow your firm at a like a top line level while building in more efficiencies because you've got that expertise and you can leverage it. One of the best things that I heard about accounting isn't that we sell widgets and we have to go keep creating them. We sell knowledge that we get to keep selling the same knowledge over and over again. And our our charge hour mentality is is a hindrance because when we get efficient at things, it doesn't change the quality of the knowledge or the value of it, but then we devalue it. So you can sell the same knowledge faster, keep your revenue similar or grow it in less time. You can fill your capacity with with delivering the knowledge and the content versus the widget. Now, when you start niching, your best clients are still going to have needs outside of that niche, right? So you're going to need a network that you trust that you can send those projects to. There's a lot of them out there. There's Alineal, there's Rootworks. We have our firm foundation. RSM and BDO have alliances. There are looser defined peer networks that, that groups and regions connect with. I think that those are going to be essential for the small and mid-sized firms to, to fully service their clients. And we're a place that they can go and we can offer those resources. One of the cool benefits we offer is you have a current CPA that's running the show at ours. I can have CPA level conversations with you. I know what you've been through. I went from staff through partner, went through mergers, have had partners transition in and out. So I've personally seen a bunch. And that Leadership Academy Network combined has seen a lot more than I have too. So there's always external resources that I can tap into to connect firms with when there's something they need that I don't know. Super cool. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that as a construct as well, too. And I imagine probably get a good response from firms as you are, because you're talking about changes that they need to make, which might seem intimidating to them if it's the first time they're getting serious about trying to implement some of those. And I'm sure they have these what-if questions for you. If you have an alliance or a network to kind of rely on, if in the event they come up with those questions, well, what if, or what do we do if we come upon this scenario, then you've got that uh, opportunity for them as well. Also, that's got to make them feel more uh, comfortable about making these changes and having that to fall back on if in the event some of these non-standard things start to happen again and they uh, need a way to handle them, right? So having that's got to make all the difference. Yes, that having a peer network that you can have a conversation with someone who's gone through 
what you're contemplating going through and gone through it successfully, it lowers your anxiety level from a 10, maybe down to an eight. And you, you can also say, all right, well, which missteps did you make? So I don't make them right. Cause smart people learn from their mistakes and wise people learn from others. Well said, love it. That's amazing. Um, so I'm interested, uh, number one, thank you a ton for being here, uh, recording this episode with me, sharing your story. It's it's always, it's a powerful one and um, I'm excited to share it with my network as well. Also, the uh, other questions I have for you before we let you go, uh, amongst anything else you'd like to share is I'd love to know uh, what, if any resources that you'd like to share with the audience where they can kind of go to, where they can go to learn more about anything we talked about on this episode or anything else you might recommend because you mentioned a couple of great resources throughout. Sure. So our website is apriofirmfoundation.com. Uh, it's still in process. It's being built just like our alliance. Uh, as I say, we're building the boat while we're sailing it. So we've got lots of ability to change and adapt. So we'll be constantly adding to it. Um, your state society probably has a lot of good networks that are are starting that you can go to. You can find some peers to kick around ideas with. Um, also encourage your younger staff to start those networks early. You know, I didn't start networking when I became a partner and then grow this big network of people I could rely on. It's been a constant evolution uh, in that way. Uh, some really good books that I've read that helped were the one by Gay Hendricks, The Big Leap. Uh, for my personal journey, like EQ versus IQ uh, by Jen Shirkani or ego versus EQ was a great way to go from like the ego part of your brain down to the emotional part of your brain and, and connect with people on, on that level. Uh, I love Tony Shea's Delivering Happiness, the guy that started uh, Zappos and sold it to Amazon and, and what mattered to him. And I really love Sean Acor. Uh, he does the Happiness Project. He's a positive psychologist out of Harvard. And his line of thought for me on putting happiness before success instead of I'll be happy when I do X, it helps you get to your success faster because you're happy along the journey and you can still move your success goalposts while having happiness instead of putting happiness afterward and we're goal-oriented, you're constantly moving your goalpost for success and happiness is always sitting on the other side of it. it. It never gets a chance to come back. Super well said that like success trap element, right? Which uh, ever since I learned about that, I realized I was, it was easy to fall into. I love that thinking of that as a construct as well. Also. Uh, so those are some excellent resources to share. I'll link to all of that in the show notes. And then I was going to mention again, um, you know, what you've talked about a couple of times on this episode, which is the, the leadership Academy. Of which I've met, you know, several alumni. I've been lucky enough to meet them, and a number of them through you as well. Also, I just have nothing but the best things to say about the people that I've met that have been through the Leadership Academy or are alumni. Just some really great people, really intense thought leaders in the space, all working on just like extremely cool stuff, pushing it forward. Like you mentioned, Tanya earlier, she's been on the show as well too. She's implemented a ton of really cool forward-thinking things at her firm, and they're just they're just killing it, like yourself, which is. Uh, so if you are lucky enough to come into contact with other people who have been alumni of the Leadership Academy, I would always say take advantage of that as much as you can. Uh, listen to them, follow them, because they're doing some really, really cool stuff in the industry. And it's, uh, it's, it's appreciated and I think really needed uh, as well. Also, so I wanted to mention that as well. Yeah, and then, yeah. um, Great group. Of course. And then last question I have for you is who should reach out to you and what's the best way for them to get in touch? So the best way to get in touch is through my email. It's mike.max at aprio.com. It's an alias, so nobody has to figure out all the consonants in my last name. Um, the people who should reach out, uh, if you're on that leadership journey yourself and you, you want to have a conversation with me at like a mentor type level, I'm always up and open for that. Uh, I've had a couple of people reach out through LinkedIn in, in that regard, and it's been really fun to connect with new folks that way. At a firm level, if if you got to here and you're really successful and you want to go there to continue to be successful, continue to exist and thrive in, in our new normal, I'd love to have a conversation with that firm and, and see if we can get their ideas in the room with the other firms that are thinking about the future, how we need to change and adapt and have those good ideas flowing so that the, the profession is is well-suited to meet the needs of the clients and the talents that are in it going forward. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Mike. And we'll link to that in the show notes as well, too, including your email. So if folks are looking for those resources, please check the show notes for this content uh, as a good place to be able to find a lot of that. And Mike, I can't thank you enough for being here, sharing your incredible uh, story with both myself and our audience. It's uh, uh, very, uh, very exciting uh, in terms of what you're working on now. And I'm super excited to have you back to talk to us more about how it's been going. Fantastic. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Accounting Automation. I hope you found it valuable. I help accounting firms scale their profit exponentially without needing to hire any additional accountants. So if your firm is in growth mode and can't keep up, I'd love to talk to you more about how I can empower your firm to do more with less through automation and technology. To learn more, visit my website, nextstep.io, or email me, sean at nextstep.io. That's sean, S-E-A-N, at nextstep.io. Next step, N-X-T-S-T-E-P dot I-O.